So I've been working over the past few days um, to sort of look at the gross market data on gold and silver and precious metals and to make a little bit of sense of it. And I've been using machine learning to help me in the process. So let's find out what I found out. There is way too much data <laughs> when it comes to, uh, to gold and silver. If you want to go through all the different types of, uh, all the different markets that affect the price of gold and silver, um, you can spend a lifetime and you will never reach an end to it. And one of the ways that I decided, look, I, I, I don't have like 100 years. I can't study this thing for like uh, <laughs> 100 years. Um, what is the fastest and most efficient way I can like try and figure something out from it? And what I did was um, I used a few machine learning programs to try and build some models, you know, to see like if there was some relationship between, you know, treasury notes, um, you know, the dollar index, uh, if they're between cryptocurrencies, um, stock market, if there was any information between those markets, that was related to the price of gold. And here's what I found, and it's, it's a little bit interesting. Um, I found that like one of the theories I had was that gold was not so much a good hedge against inflation, but gold was a good hedge against currency risk, right? You're like, okay, what do you mean by that? It means that inflation is really when you have an increase, a real increase in terms of demand, for a for goods and the goods get more expensive. Currency risk is when um, people expect that currency to be devalued. And basically my theory was, it's not so much we'll see inflation, but that we'll see sort of multiple major currencies face uh, devaluation risk. And uh, in some ways, I started doing like the, to test it out. And in the beginning, I was not finding any relationship. And I started working on a model to sort of try and help me predict when there would be gold and silver market crashes, right? When the markets will uh, crash. And I was thinking, okay, like in the beginning, I was trying to do price prediction, which was, and I started looking deeper into the models I made. And I found that there's a lot of cases where they have no relationship and it's not a good model. So I was like, okay, um, especially the one day predictor is very, very random. Um, when I dig, dug deeper into the results and the model, um, they're not great. So I wouldn't recommend using them for actual prediction. They're more like explorations. But when I started building sort of um, crash classifiers, you know, when I start classifying the relationship for cases of crashing, of market crashes, I could find some trend information of what goes into the price of gold and silver that greatly affects the price of gold and silver. And one of the things that I noticed when I, when I did uh, evaluated my models was that the Swiss franc, especially the movement, you know, the, the MACD, the 50 day MACD, so 50 day exponential average versus the 90 day exponential average. Um, in this case, this criteria was one of the most important. I was like, huh? Why? Why is that so important? And then I thought about it, you know? I thought about it. I thought, okay, why is it, why is the Swiss franc, right, so well correlated with a crash of gold and silver? So this is the Swiss francs. Uh, it is the US dollars measured by Swiss francs. So it's how many, uh, how much is, how many dollars is one, no, how many Swiss francs is one dollar worth, right? So it's USD divided by Swiss franc. And when this number goes up, right, in this case, the dollar is going up and the Swiss franc is weakening, okay? When this thing is going down, the Swiss franc, the US dollar is weakening, the Swiss franc is going up. 
Now you're like, okay, but the Swiss franc is part of the dollar index. And shouldn't we also see that in the volatility index or the dollar index? I'm like, maybe. The thing is, the Swiss franc is only 3% of the dollar index. I decided to look this up after I saw this. And I was like, okay, why do I see this? And I don't see this type of relationship um, in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of the relation between the dollar and the Swiss franc and gold. I don't see it with the dollar index. The reason is the dollar index is 3% the Swiss franc and it's almost 50, I think 55% euros. And this is the problem. See, the euro, yes, it's a different currency, but inherently the euro does exactly what the US dollar does. I mean, they're on the same trend. They're not, they are not counter cyclical. They work together. The Swiss franc and the US dollar, they're counter cyclical. What does that mean? That means that during times of crisis, the Swiss franc is the premier safe haven currency. That means that when there is risk, currency risk, the first currency that any major country, investors, central banks, whatever, will fly to is, uh, is the Swiss franc. And I, I remember one of my viewers, uh, I'll, I'll list your name. I, I don't want to butcher the pronunciation of your name. But um, he mentioned that, you know, I'm buying gold in Swiss francs. That's my problem. That's why I'm not seeing such big uh, price decreases. It's almost always flat for me. Um, it was a slight upward trend. And that's true because the Swiss franc is the premier safe haven currency. So people fly to the Swiss franc, right, when they see risk. And in some ways, the Swiss franc is the currency they buy before they buy gold. If there's immediate risk, right, a crisis, um, and they don't want to lose value in the currency they have today, everybody will just buy the Swiss franc because it's, uh, it's an accepted currency, it's in international baskets, and um, you can pay with Swiss francs, you know, it's a tier, <laughs> it's cash. Um, Gold is a little bit more complicated. Gold is now a tier one asset, so most likely like people can't fly to gold. But before, gold was never a tier one asset. It's only recently it's a tier one asset. And the problem with gold as, a, as an asset is that you cannot transfer gold between one bank and another. It's not easily transferable. You can't just tra transfer your paper gold, right, between banks. But you can transfer paper to strengths. And uh, that is one advantage the Swiss franc has over gold. The second thing is the Swiss franc is not fully backed by gold, but the Swiss National Bank has one of the largest world holdings of gold relative to its balance sheet. So the Swiss franc might not be as good as gold in terms of fiat currency, but it is almost as good as gold. So in a sense, it can be a leading indicator. If the Swiss franc, right, it's getting stronger relative to gold. And you see that it's getting stronger faster. Um, and it's going to start trending. Uh, I would say it's going to start trending upwards, which means the index is going downwards <laughs> in this case. So in this case, and the dollar is going downwards, um, you will see a bull market. And the inverse is true. If the index is getting stronger and the Swiss franc is going downwards, and you see that it's going to develop a bear trend for the Swiss franc, most likely we're going to see a bear market for gold and sooner or later a crash for gold. This is, this is uh, what this is saying in this case. And um, in some cases, the other things are also somewhat true. Silver is very highly correlated with gold. Um, I'm also seeing that, you know, I added cryptocurrencies into it, I added Bitcoin, and I think, you know, Bitcoin, uh, if Bitcoin is moving upwards, this is pretty funny. If Bitcoin is trending upwards, right? The trend of Bitcoin is going upwards. It means we're in a risk on environment. This is something that a lot of people don't understand is that Bitcoin and gold are actually not related. They're inversely related. And um, they don't move in the same direction, not all the time. I mean, every time, like last time, I think the, the last... Bitcoin sort of a boom happened in 2016, 17, and uh, gold was completely depressed during that time. So they are, if you look at how they move in the long term, they are 
counter-cyclical. So if Bitcoin is crashing, potentially you see a bull market in gold. If Bitcoin jumps like crazy, you might see a crash in gold. And we've seen this, uh, I mean, over the few months, this, this period during the pandemic, um, we've been on market like risk on, risk off, risk on, risk off, depending on the news. That's why I'm saying it's news trading. So it's very hard to observe the trends, right? Um, so I think in this case, sort of Bitcoin um, right now, you know, it's, it's going down a little. People are feeling like, you know, it's a bit overvalued and so is the stock market and everything else. So to go back to the recent point, do these like do these assumptions stand up to the general market that the Swiss franc is a leading indicator to uh, gold prices and gold ch price changes, whether it can be used to sort of give us a leading indicator of whether we're going to head to a bull market or not. And um, so I decided to look at the US dollar versus the Swiss franc. And here's what I noticed, right? Let's see. So I also have, I can't fit everything into one screen. Anyways, so in September at this point, gold started moving, this started moving upwards. This means that we will potentially see a decrease in the price of gold. It means that the dollar is getting stronger, it's getting stronger very quickly. This is the 50 versus 90 day close um, of the expenditure averages. It's a, it's, it's a type of MCAT. I've, I have multiple MCATs in uh, MACDs in my, uh, in, my, uh, in my machine learning program. I have the 12 versus 30. I have a 50 versus 90, 50 versus 100 and so on. And this is the one that relates the most. It says that it was the most optimal one. Um, so anyways, when I, when I look at this, right, I'm like, hmm, did gold enter a bear market during this period? And we can see from here, right, this is September, this part here. We're entering a bear market. And did it predict a, predict a crash at a certain point? It predicted this crash, this crash, this crash. So this moving up means that we have potentials for crashes. What about now? You're like, oh, but we're in a bull market. Look here. See? The trend is inverting. If we follow the trend, if you zoom into this, you can do this. We are trending downwards. We're going back into negative MACD for 50 over 90. It means that right now we are seeing weakness in the dollar and the Swiss franc is getting stronger. This is what we're seeing right now. Has this been able to predict previous bull runs? So if we go down here, right, we look at this period here. This is between uh, April, this is June. And if we go here, June, it's around here, right roughly here. And we can see that this downward trend more or less led to this melt up. This is a case where the US is going down, CHF, CH is going up. It's quite strong. I would say there, there's a quite a strong, I would say there's some relationship. I wouldn't emphasize that this is a perfect relationship, but essentially the Swiss franc, if the Swiss franc is getting stronger, is it trending towards a Swiss franc bull market? There's quite a good chance that we will see a gold bull market. That's what this is saying. That's what this classifier is saying. This is not a price prediction. This is a trend classification uh, sort of a system I was trying to build. And this is what it was telling me. It was telling me that, look, if your sort of midterm movement of the Swiss rank is starting to trend in a certain direction, gold will trend in a certain direction. If the Swiss rank is trending to become going to a bull market and you can sort of expect it to start going to a bull market looking at the fundamentals, macroeconomics, and so on, then gold will increase. And also one thing you have to keep in mind, and why the Swiss franc might be a better measurement than the dollar index, is that Swiss franc, while it's 3% of the dollar index, it is the number one safe haven currency, right? <laughs> this is the thing, it is the number one safe haven. 
disputed like that you could use the Japanese yen, but the Japanese yen, they use also a lot of QE and there's quite a lot of currency risk with the Japanese yen. I haven't, I don't know if I added the Japanese yen to uh, my graph. I believe I do. But uh, it was, I think, since the 1990s that uh, when I looked at the different uh, information, it started being dissociated from the price of gold. The Swiss franc seems to be holding, like, at least the direction it moves seems to be quite well correlated with the price of gold. The other thing you have to know about the Swiss franc is that starting from here, right, the Swiss National Bank constantly doing intervention on this. It's trying to move this back up. So if, if the Swiss National Bank does about, I think they're doing uh, 50 billion dollars worth of currency intervention every week. This is not monthly, this is not over a year, every single week, that makes around 200 billion, right? To try and prop up, the, to, to try weaken the Swiss franc and they're failing, it means that Investors are feeling <laughs> enormous currency risk with the US dollar, with the euro, with uh, the two major currencies in the dollar index. And, uh, and the Swiss franc is just like skyrocketing. But it's also because, you know, and these, there means that also that there are more people on the market buying Swiss francs than the Swiss National Bank can sell. I'm not talking about a small scale investor. I'm not talking about JP Morgan. This is the Swiss Federal Reserve cannot sell enough Swiss francs to, <laughs> to bring the Swiss, to weaken the Swiss franc despite the demand of Swiss francs. So this is a highly, highly like risky situation. And I think what's happening is they're trying to sell Swiss francs. People are trying to buy Swiss francs. It's getting to a ridiculous amount. This is a ridiculous price. This, the Swiss franc is so expensive at this moment for what it is. It's a tiny economy. It is a fiat currency. People might just like, you know, there's overspill from this market because it's a tiny market. It's not a big market. The Swiss franc relative to other currencies, of course, it is still big, but it's not a big market relative to other currencies you will have spillover and you have spillover into gold and gold will start moving upwards again. If we have strong weakness in the Swiss franc for an extended period, at least what the model is saying is that it seems to believe that there's a strong risk on, or at least it doesn't understand it's a risk on environment, but these are proxies for risk. And um, it believes that there's a strong risk off, sorry, strong risk off environment. People are scared about the markets tanking any moment and um, they're picking up the Swiss franc. And I think uh, we, if the Swiss franc keeps on getting stronger, at least it starts trending stronger, and we don't see it keep on going to positive direction, it stays in the negative zone, you know, it's like sort of grinding downwards slowly because the Swiss National Bank is constantly intervening. It stays under the 0 0.9 range, right? And it goes, it's less than 0 0.92, let's say, and then it it starts trending downwards to like 0 0.887 and then 0 0.88. We will see a strong support, I think, for a melt up of the, the gold market. However, however, this is the other thing you have to be careful. If you see that the Swiss franc is weakening, against the dollar. That means that you see this thing here, right? You see, uh, where else do I see? You see something like this here. You see something like this part here where you see the dollar, you know, you see the dollar strengthening against the Swiss franc. And remember in 2019, in this period, Gold was cheap. I mean, gold was what, 2019 gold. I don't have it going back, but this is May, July, September, 2020, 2019 gold after October, November. So around this period, gold went down. I mean, this is, <laughs> and then when it flattened out, it couldn't make a breakout. Gold went up. When it didn't down here, gold went up. When it had a little bump here, went down, had a little up, down. You can see it's 
<laughs> it's inversely related. You kind of have to like, I don't know, take a mirror and sort of, uh, sort of uh, inversely like map it out <laughs> somehow, but it's inversely related to each other. Um, and you can see here when you had from April, let's say July, May, April, May, April, around this area, right? You saw that the MACD was coming up and then it had a potential to reverse. Like right here, it started reverting. And we are potentially at this point. And this, when you see this direction, that it starts directing itself downwards, it's a predictor that potentially gold is going to move upwards. And, um, and the Swiss franc typically moves a little bit faster than gold. So it could be a lead, good leading indicator, at least a at least an indicator that leads, I would say, like three to two days in advance. It's not so far. It's, it's not like a crystal ball. And you cannot predict where the Swiss franc will go in the long term. So this is the thing I've, I've picked out. So glad to share this with you guys. If you're looking to, uh, to see when you might want to slow down your stacking, track the Swiss franc's long-term trend. Um, and you can do that with the MACD. You can take like, you just go to gold.org, open the graph, type in USDCHF, and then you add the MACD and you set your MACD to 50, 90. And then you can see the trend. And anytime you're going to see a reversion, you expect to see a reversion or it's heading towards a reversion, um, you will have to blow it up. But if you see like it's, this is the, um, this is the uh, 50 day, the 90 day, sorry. And then if you see the 50 day starts curving upwards and then it looks like that it's going to go into a reversion, the macroeconomic factors are pretty good. The US dollar might want to raise interest rates and so on, you know, um, that might be a potential time to be like, okay, slow down on stacking, don't make your order. It's going to be cheaper probably in like three months time. That <laughs> so I'm like, okay, now, now I have some, uh, some guidance on how I can probably like buy and sell my gold. Um, I have to thank some of my viewers because when I mentioned I, I buy in Swiss francs, I don't see much of a big of a change. Some of you guys are currency traders and um, you're mentioning my problem is the Swiss franc. And that's what pulled me onto this piece and pulled me when I was looking at sort of my um, classifier data. I was like, I can make sense of it because otherwise it will be out of context. I'll be like, yeah, it's correlated with Swiss franc, but you know, uh, dollar index is more balanced. I would just shove it onto the index. Um, but then I looked at the index. I was like, huh, the index only has 3% Swiss francs. And um, I was like, and within the index, that is the safe haven currency. Of course, also in the index, there's a Swedish kroner. And then uh, there is also, uh, I think, uh, the British pound. So, but I think the British pound, the euro, and the dollar, they're pretty much in the same boat. They're not so much independent from each other. Um, and they're all major trading partners with each other. So they're inherently more or less linked. And the ECB and the Federal Reserve and the, uh, I think last time we, there was um, a few months ago, the three central banks got together to discuss what they were going to do next. And they talk with each other. They coordinate their actions because when they devalue their currencies, they have to be on board, all three of them, to do it. And they might do it to different degrees, using different instruments, but they will go in the same direction. And the only one within that group, in that dollar index, that doesn't go in the same direction is, um, or who doesn't have the tools to go so hard in the same direction is the Swiss National Bank because they're tiny and they're in the middle smack middle of Europe and they're safe haven currency. Their job is tough. You know, they can't just devalue their currency that easily. So, um, yeah. So this seems to be one of the better indicators I found after a few days. I'm running some more analysis on the models. It will take, <laughs> it will take 12 hours per model. Uh, and I expect it to run for about five days. Um, I might get results earlier. I might see that there's some models that just take too long to an analyze. Because what it has to do is it takes the data, it does some tests on it, evaluates some of the models, evaluates like the accuracy and so on. And and um, I'm not just using regression models. I'm right, I'm also using classifiers. 
and the classifiers, I'll have to test it against like the probability of specific like um, specific increase uh, trends. That's what I'm going to do because it seems like the classifiers are doing a better job at predicting sort of price direction, which is normal than re the regression models and um, and I'll have to use multiple classifiers to try and classify different tranks and then try to build a program to give me like the most probable like price out of out of uh, out of the out of the prediction rather than just uh, trying to do regress and then estimate a price you know. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's why it's taking so long. And uh, right now, I've got three computers running. Uh, it just takes so long to parse all that information. <laughs> it's just like I wasn't expecting initially when I took out uh, look at a few examples online. Um, it was pretty fast. They were doing on low low uh, amounts of data. And then when I started adding things like uh, MACD with RSI and so on into the data set, it just started blowing up the time to learn and look at relationships. And uh, yeah, <laughs> anyways, uh, to conclude, if you want, like, you know, you, some of you guys asked me, what's the relationship? What's a good indicator for looking at, uh, looking at uh, the movement to predict sort of the general trend of the price of gold, uh, the Swiss franc, the Swiss franc, the direction, the MACD, specifically the MACD of the Swiss franc and uh, reading the MACD and reading sort of like whether the, there's going to be an inverted trend or a pause. For example, if you see that you're currently in an extremely bullish, like 100 day Swiss franc movement, right? And it's just going to go all the way down here, like just in a straight line. Um, yeah, uh, gold might be, uh, uh, might just go exponential. Um, right now, I would say since 2000 and since back here, right? The Swiss franc has been on a I would say a downward trend relative to uh, the dollar. And the main reason I think is the Swiss franc doesn't do QE as much as the Swiss National Bank can't do QE to the same scale as the Federal Reserve, right? It just cannot, <laughs> it just can't. <laughs> or the ECB just can't do that. Um, and uh, without utterly destroying the currency, it just can't. So it has, it walks a very fine line. It doesn't want the currency to be too strong, but it can't also just like dump it because you know people use that money in their daily lives. So they, they're faced with a very tough situation. And uh, basically I think that's, that's the situation they're faced with. That's also sort of the situation I see for gold that in the long term, if we are going to be on the same monetary policy for all these countries for the next 30 years, Gold and silver are going to be on a slow upward trend. It's not going to be explosive like boom, boom, boom. There will be times when you will get buy indicators when you see that you're kind of at a bottom of like the trend at the end of the trend and then we're going to uh, move revert. Then uh, that might be a good time to buy uh, gold and silver. And typically I think the cycles are roughly uh, April to June 2 to yeah, between two and three months, each like uh, movement. So the cycles are, the total cycle is a six half year cycle. So there are points where it might be better to, uh, you can swing trade actually the gold because it's relatively predictable. And uh, you can find out the bottoms and then buy and then so on. So you might be able to swing trade gold and maximize your profits on the bull market that way. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I had to say for today. Uh, and also you can also short gold at certain points, you know, because it's predictable that it will crash if the Swiss franc is uh, getting too weak and the dollar is going uh, up and then we're in a risk on environment. Um, that's, uh, I'll post, uh, I'll, I don't have the compiled data, so I won't post this in this video. I'll post it in a future video when I have all of the compiled data to tell you like, what are the better models to use? And uh, thank you for watching. If you want further information, leave a comment and I'll try and answer the best of my knowledge and based on what I, what I have. And uh, thank you very much for uh, watching. Have a great, uh, no, it's not Friday, it's Thursday. So um, yeah, have a great day and uh, leave a like, helps the video a lot. And thank you for watching. Dave out.